Yes. So um, <clears throat> when we finished last time, we were talking about Lorentz forces, if you remember correctly. Lorentz forces, which are the, the essentially uh, the new force uh, that needs to be added added to the momentum equation. And when we say uh, new force, what do, you, what do we mean? New uh, with regard to our uh, previous discussion of neutral fluids, isn't it? Everything else was the same. Uh, we had the gradient of pressure, we had the gradient of pressure, body force, and everything, right? But the Lorentz forces were the new thing. And what did the Lorentz forces look like? The Lorentz forces it essentially the Lorentz force density, okay, which is force per unit volume, and it looked like a J cross B, where this is current density. And this is the magnetic field. I am neglecting, uh, uh, there is a factor of 1 over 4 pi or something out, out front, but um, all that is present in the, actual in the actual slides that I will be showing you. But um, uh, this is the main part, right? J cross B. Now, you remember that this is a bit of a curious force, right? Uh, the Lorentz force is a little curious. Why? Why do we call it curious? Because it is the force on an element of neutral but current carrying fluid. So this is a little, you know, um, at variance um, with, with our usual ideas of uh, fluid element, fluid element really, okay. This, this neutrality is a little bit of at variance with our ideas of, of um, you know, Lorentz forces, which is which we normally think of as a Q, Q times V cross B kind of force, isn't it? Um, where you know the Q is an explicit charge, right? So the fact that you know now we're suddenly saying that this this fluid element is neutral is a little funny. So how can you have a Lorentz force? This is something that we need to come to grips with. At the same time, you're saying that the, we're saying that you know the, the 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 fluid element is neutral, but it's still current carrying. There's a J, right? So this these are issues that we need to sort of come to grips with, and um, uh, the, the, these are related to um, you know the curiosities with regard to the idea of current itself in in in, in magnetohydrodynamics, which we have talked about. The best way out, as we have seen. Uh, as I've remarked earlier, the best way is to not assign any, uh, shall we say, physical significance to the current density. Okay, simply regard the current density this as a proxy for the curl of B. 
as in the current density although i mean it has the dimensions of current density it's perfectly valid to think of it in terms of current density and so on and so forth but you know it's it's, uh, it's because of all these oddities that we encounter uh, the fact that the, the that the fluid is uncharged um, you know and yet you need to think of, of it in terms of current density and so on and so forth it's best to sort of think of it as a proxy or a, as a shorthand for curl of b wherever you see wherever you see j wherever you see j you plug in a curl of b there okay so this is the thing therefore the lorentz force the lorentz force is really the lorentz force density lorentz force density is really curl of b cross b this is the lorentz force density okay so again if so so if someone asks you what is a new thing what is a new element of force that appears uh, in magnetohydrodynamics uh, or rather uh, what is the one new thing that appears in magnetohydrodynamics as opposed to regular neutral hydrodynamics uh, uh, tell me one new thing. Well, your answer should be, well, magnetohydrodynamics deals with a magnetized fluid, a magnetized and charged neutral fluid, a fluid which is somehow carrying a magnetic field along with it. That is it, okay? There is no scope for an electric field, uh, um, you know, in the fluid because as we know, the fluid is infinitely conducting and so, any uh, any presence of an electric field will be immediately shorted out okay by the fact that you know that the, the fluid is highly conducting so there is no scope for any electrical charges but there is no scope for any electrical field as such however there is no such thing as shorting out a magnetic field because there are no free magnetic charges therefore even in an infinitely conducting fluid a magnetic field can exist and the main thing about magnetohydrodynamics is that this is a manifestation of a magnetized fluid. So point number one, there are magnetic fields. And so the new element of force and, and there are magnetic fields and what's more there are magnetic fields which can have a curl. Okay, there can be a curl to the magnetic field. Okay, and therefore there is, the, here is the new term that needs to be added to the momentum equation and that is curl of B cross B. Okay, so here is the thing. And now, you see, this curl of B cross, and so this is the Lorentz force. This is the Lorentz force density, curl of B cross. So, so this is the new element that needs to be added to, you can say J cross B, yes, but it's really curl of B cross B. Okay, now you see in the momentum equation, what are the other, what are the other terms? The other terms, uh, well, apart from body force, the other term in the Lorentz equation, uh, in, in the force equation are uh, things like the gradient of a scalar pressure. Okay, and this is on the same footing as the Lorentz force density because it appears in the, I mean, you know, it's just one more term on the right hand side, on the F side of, of things and therefore um, uh, it, 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 as such it's the same as this, okay. So now you can think of this as the dive inst I mean, it's, it's, it's the, it, the dimension wise, it has to be the same as a gradient of a scalar pressure. Uh, finally, when, when you do this operation, it's on the same footing, yes. So you can think of this as the divergence of the magnetic stress. Tensor. 
So, this is a new tensor that we are introducing this m in order to understand what the b looks like. And what are the, I mean essentially what, what does the divergence of a tensor look like? Well, the ith component of the divergence of this is just d m i j d x j, where as we have, we have discussed many times before, uh, you know uh, the appearance of this repeated index simply uh, it means summation. So, the ith component of this divergence is simply uh, say, say let us let us let's be concrete, let us say this i is x. Okay. So, this would be d m x x d x okay, where now my g, the i is x in any case. So, first of all I say j is equal to x right. So, it would be d m x x d x plus since I need to sum, sum over j I would have d m x y d y plus d m x z d z. Okay. Let me write this down explicitly. So, that is what the divergence of this. Uh, so, I, I will repeat this. I will repeat this here. So, uh, uh, sorry. The ith component of this is where there because of the appearance of the j as a, as, as, as a you know it is repeated the summation over j is implied. So, therefore, say the x, uh, the, the x component of I always seem to make uh, this mistake uh, I do not write the m properly for some reason it is just this pen I guess I do not know. So, the x component would be d m x x d x plus d m x y d y plus d m x z d z. And the y component would be well the it is it's just the second index that starts you know uh, uh, sorry. So, so in, in the yth component in this in that case the first index would now be y. So, you would have d y x d x plus d y y d y plus d y z d z that is how it goes. So, that is all right. So, now let us uh, go back to our slides and let us look at this. So, uh, this is what I was saying. So, this is the magnetic stress tensor and where the ijth component of the stress would be uh, would be written as this uh, 1 8 b square 1 over 8 pi b square delta ij minus 1 over 4 pi b i b j. So, uh, if you look at this, this would be the diagonal component sorry th this would be the diagonal component. This would be the diagonal term. So, terms like d m x x d x, uh, d m y y d y, d m z z d z, these would be the diagonal components and those would be these, right? And these would be the off diagonal components. So, and we know the diagonal components are, 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 are uh, much like uh, the usual scalar pressure, whereas this is more like a tangential stress and let us look at this a little more. Okay. So, the, the point I, I wanted to motivate this a little more. The reason we are now talking about this magnetic stress tensor is to move away from assigning too much of a physical significance to the current density. I, I, I be, you know, people do talk about J in, in MHD a lot. But really, uh, uh, J does not have that much of a physical significance and really it is all about magnetic fields. Okay. And the fact that you have a non-zero curl to the magnetic field may, and so this curl cross B cross B, B makes the magnetic field behave in a certain way. Okay, and we are trying to understand and, 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 and it makes it behave like a pressure tensor and we are trying to understand what it means. 
That's the reason we are starting to talk about the magnetic stress tensor. Okay, right. So, yeah. So, uh, the, 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 the tangential stress is, is much like elasticity and let's try to understand this. It's something like this and we will come back to this diagram in a minute once again. Essentially, the bottom line is that the consequence of, of this equation is that magnetic field lines behave much like a bunch of rubber bands. Magnetic field lines behave like rubber bands like a bunch of rubber bands suppose you th these were magnetic field lines these blue lines were magnetic field lines and so they were a bunch of rubber bands now what do you expect from a bunch of rubber bands right you you try to pull these rubber bands you try to pull them along the same direction and you would expect a tension along the rubber bands, right? The, it would, they would resist pulling. You try to lengthen them and they would make, they, they, they would try to resist uh, uh, the act of lengthening them and so they, they would try to contract. So that is number one. So that would be, so this, this tendency that we just described would be manifest um, in this, okay? The other thing, is that a bunch of rubber bands they would resist squeezing okay you 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 take a bunch of rubber bands and you try to squeeze them you try to squeeze them in the perpendicular direction they will resist squeezing they will not like to be squeezed okay they will have a pressure that resists this squeezing so it turns out that the character of this curl, curl b cross b is much like that so they resist squeezing and pulling so magnetic field lines behave much like rubber bands and we will see how. Yeah. So recall the magnetic stress tensor is defined by this. Yeah. Uh, where, where the fact that I've, I've, I've uh, you know, denoted uh, M in bold phase means that uh, you know, M is a, is a tensor. Now what we do now is by the divergence theorem, what we have done here is we have, we have uh, you know, uh, 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 this is essentially the volume integral of, uh, well, there's one over four pi outside, but this is the volume integral of the divergence of, that's this. And we use, you know, the usual divergence theorem to make it look like this. Yeah, so we want to transform the volume integral into a surface integral like this. And so n would be the outward normal of the surface. Okay, so you would have an n dot m ds. Yeah, so that we, we are using the divergence theorem here, except the divergence theorem for a tensor. Same thing, exactly the same concept, no difference. Okay, right. So now using the definition m i j, so this is the, the definition, the i j component of m is this. Yeah, so I, I, I use this definition in here. Mind the sign. The sign is very important, the, 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 the negative sign is very important. So now what happens is this a, n dot m is essentially a force. Isn't it? That's what this is saying. And what is the force? The force is n dot m, which is b squared, one, 1 over 8 pi b squared, because there's a dotting. The, this, this, this term is in the direction of whatever n there is, the, the outward directed normal, and this fellow uh, becomes, uh, uh, you know, uh, B, Bn. Okay, so this comes from here and this comes from here. So now let us say that B like that, a z hat, I mean a, a magnetic field that's exclusively in the z direction, okay? And uh, uh, let us consider a magnetic field that is exclusively in the z direction, which means that the n will be in the x and y directions, isn't it? So for a z directed magnetic field, what, what's happening? How is this force directed? 
That's a question we are asking. So this is exclusively in the z direction, right? So, so this b is, is just exclusively in the z direction and that has a negative sign. You see this, right? So therefore, the, for a z directed magnetic field, never mind this, because this b is exclusively in the z direction and there's a negative sign, the, the, there is a force along the negative z direction. So this says that the force wants to contract the rubber bands, contract the magnetic fields in the z direction. In other words, there's a force along the negative z direction and that, this comes from this. That is, and the contraction, the adjective contract is because of this negative sign. That's evident from here, isn't it? On the other hand, here there's a positive sign. And wh what direction is this? It's 1 over 8 pi b squared n in the direction of n hat, which is anything perpendicular to the z direction, which is along the x and y direction. Okay, so it wants to expand in the x and y directions. Okay, so it's very much like a bunch of rubber bands which which likes to have a, you know, a minus z directed force. In other words, it tends to want to contract along the z direction as evident from here and it wants to expand in the x and y directions as evident from here. So it's very much like this. It's very much, this is why this justifies the fact that uh, B fields are like a bunch of rubber bands. Just like a bunch of rubber bands do not want to be pulled. If you try to pull them, they will try to contract. And that is the minus z directed force that you saw here. That you saw here. And just like a bunch of rubber bands, they don't like to be squeezed. If you try to squeeze them, they will try to expand. And that expansion force is in the, is, 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 is in the directions that is perpendicular to z, right? In other words, in the x and y directions, just like here, just like here. Okay, so this is the nature of magnetic stresses, which is a direct consequence of the fact that there is this additional term in the momentum equation, which is the Lorentz force term. Okay, so this is, uh, I, I thought I would spend a little bit of time explaining this before going ahead, because it's, it's central to much of the applications in astrophysics that we will, we will come across. So, uh, so this is about magnetic stresses. Yeah, so in summary, magnetic field lines inside a conducting fluid act rather like a deformable elastic medium. However, the stress is highly anisotropic. It is, you know, it, it, normally an elastic medium, you know, elasticity, uh, you, you normally don't think of elasticity as an anisotropic thing. Okay, uh, elasticity, the coefficient of elasticity or whatever is the same in all directions. However, in this case, it is highly anisotropic. Okay, the stress is very different parallel to and perpendicular to the magnetic field. As we saw, parallel to the magnetic field, you know, uh, the, the, the stress uh, tends to contract the magnetic field. Perpendicular to the magnetic field, it tends to make the magnetic field expand. Okay, so it's highly anisotropic. It is always under compression in the two directions perpendicular to the field. It's always under compression and it is always under tension along the field. Along the field, in other words, along the z direction in this particular case. The example we took was uh, the, the, that the b, uh, you know, was uh, oriented along the z direction. Along the z direction, it is always under tension. Okay, right, so, yeah, so here is the other thing. The analogy of, with rubber bands is good, it's all, uh, it's all good, but however, if you should not carry this analogy too far because rubber bands can be broken. You can, you can cut rubber bands, whereas you cannot cut magnetic fields. Magnetic fields are bound to always be in loops. 
So it, uh, the magnetic field rubber bands cannot be broken. So it is not as if the tension along the fields make the volume contract. No, the, the volume as such remains the same. All right. The other thing is the magnetic tension really manifests itself only when field lines are curved. In other words, for straight field lines, there is really no magnetic tension. It's only when you have curved field lines like this, okay, that the tension along the field lines manifests itself. And what's more, uh, it, it, it manifests itself and in the following way, you get the equivalent of, of a centrifugal force. Or is it center pedal? I think it's center pedal force. Okay, uh, so so magnetic field lines, uh, field line tension manifests itself only when the, you try to curve the field lines. It behaves like an elastic rubber band. It resists the curving. Okay, it wants to snap back. It wants to become straight again when you try to uh, curve it. So we talked a little bit about magnetic tension. There is another interesting thing, a consequence of magnetic pressure, and that is buoyancy. And this is very important in, in astrophysical situation, the, the concept of magnetic buoyancy. The fact that a mag magnetized fluid exhibits um, something called buoyancy, it's like this. We have defined the magnetic stress tensor. In general, there is also regular gas pressure, isn't it? There is also regular gas pressure, P gas. Right? So in addition to magnetic pressure, 1 over 8 pi b squared, there is also regular gas pressure, which is something like, uh, you know, nkt. Yeah. So, and we have already written, down in the, uh, written it down in the equation of motion anyway as, as, as a gradient of uh, p. Yeah. So now we can write a total stress tensor as, this is the usual scalar gas pressure, b, and the b squared over 8 pi delta ij also looked like a gas pressure, regular gas pressure, because these, these are also totally diagonal. So you might as well club them both and write them right here. Okay. And, and these are the off diagonal terms. So these would be the diagonal terms, and these would be off diagonal terms, right? So now, let us for a minute say body forces are not important. So neglecting those, you can write down the equation of motion uh, as uh, rho dv dt equals minus divergence of a total uh, stress tensor, which includes gas pressure as well as magnetic pressures, mt, right? But the mt is this. Now. Essentially, what we do is you consider uh, a region with uh, two kinds of, uh, you know, uh, with, with, with a pressure P1, with a gas pressure P1 and a magnetic field B1 on, on one side, and a gas pressure P2 and a magnetic field B2 on the other side. And you consider this little pillbox here, okay, on, on the boundary with an outwardly directed normal like this, yeah. And uh, so, so integrate the equation of motion over the little pillbox which has a vanishingly small thickness, okay? And if you integrate, because of the fact that you have a vanishingly small thickness, you, you integrate this, yeah, which is essentially f dot ds by the divergence theorem. You integrate this over the pillbox and that has to be zero. Because the small edge is vanishingly small, because you know this edge, which is a small edge, is vanishingly small. And as far as this edge is concerned, Right, uh, the stress on the other surfaces is perpendicular to the face, so therefore the f dot. Right, so because the stress is perpendicular to the face, the f dot ds has to be has to be zero, right? So that's why this is zero. So therefore, applying the divergence theorem, which is which is which is essentially essentially this is equal to saying that f dot ds equals zero, applying this, we get the pressure, the, the, uh, the so-called pressure balance condition, which is that this is the gas pressure and this is the magnetic pressure. So the sum of the gas and magnetic pressures on both sides 
has to be the same. So if you have a highly magnetized, if you, if you have a volume, if for instance you have a, 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 you know, a bundle of magnetic field lines like this, you have a volume where you have high, high, uh, in here you have high magnetic fields and outside you have low magnetic fields, okay. Because the gas pressure plus the magnetic pressure has to be the same inside and outside, okay. Outside you have low magnetic field, so you have low magnetic pressure, therefore the gas pressure has to be higher. Inside you have high magnetic fields, therefore you have to have low gas pressure, okay. What is one way of having low gas pressure? Having low density, okay. So high B also means low density. Okay, so in this volume, which has uh, uh, somehow, uh, I say it's a flux tube. Okay, a flux tube with high magnetic fields. In here, uh, because of the high magnetic fields, you have low density, low gas density. And what, what does a uh, element with low density do? It's acted upon by buoyant forces. Right, it floats to the surface because of buoyancy, and that is what magnetic buoyancy is all about. Okay. This flux tube is buoyant. Because you have high magnetic fields, you have low density, low gas density and because there is low gas density, this bundle of magnetic fields floats upwards. It is subject to buoyant forces. Okay. And so this is the central idea behind magnetic buoyancy. So we will stop here for the time being. Thank you.